Hello and welcome class. Today we are going to be finishing chapter two. So far we have talked about uh, the atom, the construction of the atom, right? The subatomic particles that go into making it, those electrons, protons, and neutrons. We've talked about how atoms can vary in the sense that we can have different isotopes of different masses and we can have different ions with different charges. Well, what could be left then when it comes to discussing the construction of the atom. Well, today we are going to be talking about how we count atoms. Uh, of course, atoms are too very small for us to be able to actively see them with the naked eye, as I'm kind of illustrating here, this horrific looking eye. Uh, and this is our atom. We can't actually see atoms. So how is it that we count them? How is it that we get around not being able to see them to actually know how many atoms or how many molecules we are working with? Well, that comes down to the unit of the mole. That's what we're gonna be talking about today. So, what is the mole? The mole quite simply is 6.022 times 10 to the 23 of whatever. Doesn't matter what it is. It just happens to work well for atoms and molecules, but technically we could have a mole of whatever. And the reason why is because it functions effectively like the dozen, which is just 12 of whatever, right? So we can kind of think of the mole as the uh, like chemist's dozen. So instead of 12, we have 6.022 times 10 to the 23. But again, it's for whatever it is that we're working with. So like with the dozen, we could have a dozen eggs, we could have a dozen donuts, uh, we could have a dozen of whatever. The mole is just a larger number, a larger quantity. All right, so let's say we have a mole of something that we actually like know, right? Something that we've visibly seen, have worked with, maybe seen on TV. Let's say we have a mole of moles, right? The furry little creature, it's about the size of your like fist, maybe like a little bit larger. Well, a mole of moles, just to emphasize how big the number of the mole is, uh, a mole of moles would cover the earth a distance of 80 kilometers deep. So we can see in this illustration, there's the mantle, the earth's crust, the height of the mole of moles across the entire planet. This is an even distribution. They're not sinking into the ocean. It's just over the surface of the planet. It would cover uh, the surface 80 kilometers deep. We can see Mount Everest here, all of the displaced air gets pushed upwards, we can see here, and uh, from the surface of the earth, if you were to be standing buried underneath this mole of moles, um, you can see that the, uh, like, the moles get you one to a third of the way to the International Space Station. So it's a huge number. A mole is humongous. Now this is again just to emphasize not only what a large number the mole is, but also in contrast, how small atoms and molecules are. Because a mole of atoms or a mole of molecules is uh, roughly like the size of something that could like fit into your, like you could hold it in your hand, right? So atoms and molecules are incredibly tiny. So how did we come up with this number? How did we find the mole? Well, here's how. 12 atomic mass units was, back in the day, arbitrarily decided to be the mass, the standard mass for one carbon-12 atom. So if we have a carbon atom that contains six neutrons and six protons, this is like the standardized element on the periodic table. All other masses are standard to this. So the 12 atomic mass unit, like where the atomic mass unit, I guess I should say is like standardized to is the carbon 12 atom. One carbon 12 atom weighs exactly 12 AMUs. So the question was asked how many carbon 12 atoms would be needed to create a perfect 12 gram sample. So the gram, again, being a unit that is more appreciable and comprehensible on the macroscopic scale, uh, how many, right, counting numbers like one, two, three, four, how many carbon atoms would cause uh, the mass of like this chunk of carbon to be equal to 12 grams. Well, what we found through experimentation was that 12 grams of carbon 12, like the perfect carbon 12 uh, uh, isotope, 
would be comprised of Avogadro's numbers worth, so 6.022 times 10 to the 23rd atoms, and this was also defined then as being equal to one mole. So not only are the masses on the periodic table standardized to carbon-12, but the mole is also standardized to carbon-12 to make sure everything here is self-consistent. So all of the masses that are present on the periodic table then end up being average, what we call average molar masses for the elements, right? Because if you are working with just an element, like picking it up off the shelf, like a hunk of iron, let's say, uh, you don't know exactly what isotope you're working with. And honestly, it is probably an average that matches the uh, like fractional abundances across the entire universe. So if we were to, let's say, pick up a chunk of carbon off of the shelf, this average molar mass, if we were to mass out 12.011, so we're taking into account the fact that we might have some carbon-13, carbon-14, uh, if we mass out 12.011 grams of carbon, we would have one mole of carbon, aka we would be holding 6.022 times 10 to the 23rd atoms of carbon. So this mass on the periodic table is not only a mass in atomic mass units, but it is also a mass in what we call grams per mole. All right, so the atomic masses that are present on the periodic table for all of the elements are also all atomic molar masses. This is equal to the mass per one mole of any element, again, in the units of grams per mole. And the reason why this works, just to reiterate, is because all masses are relative to carbon-12. So not only is the mole relative to carbon-12, but all of these masses are relative to carbon-12. So everything here is self-consistent. If we know what the identity of the substance we are working with is, let's say lithium, and you are holding a hunk of lithium in your hand that had the mass of 6.941 grams, you would be holding one mole of lithium and you would be also equivalently holding 6.022 times 10 to the 23rd lithium atoms. Let's say we're working with calcium. If you had a hunk of calcium that, was, or that had the mass of 40.078 grams in your hand, equivalently, you would be holding one mole of calcium and you would be holding 6.022 times 10 to the 23rd calcium atoms. With uranium, if you were holding a hunk of uranium, right, that had a mass of 238.0289 grams, this would be the, the equivalent of one mole, so I'm just gonna write this all down for all of them, equals one mole, equals one mole, equals one mole, which is all equal to Avogadro's number, equaling 6.022 times 10, to two times 10 to the 23rd atoms. And the reason why the masses then end up being different, right? If you had like Avogadro's numbers worth of atoms, so 6.022 times 10 to the 23rd lithium atoms, this is going to have a lesser mass than something like uranium because lithium has fewer protons, it has fewer neutrons, it has fewer electrons inside of the atom. So these masses will vary but the count, the one mole, equaling 6.022 times 10 to the 23rd atoms will stay the same. All right, so we can use these molar masses, these atomic molar masses, which is again, the mass of a mole. That's how we can remember what a molar mass is as opposed to just a straight up mass. It is the mass pertaining to uh, how many atoms you are working with. It's standard or relative to how many atoms you are working with. Well, we can use the handy dandy flowchart below to interconvert between numbers of atoms, numbers of moles, and the mass of the substance that you are working with. So to go back to the original question from the start of this lecture, if you uh, were working with a particular substance, and you wanted to know how many atoms you were working with or how many molecules you were working with, because again, we can't see atoms and molecules, how would you know? This is how we know. 
Because of previous research that has been done, we know approximately how many grams go into one mole of a substance, and because moles are directly related to numbers of atoms through Avogadro's number, which again is that 6.022 times 10 to the 23rd, whatever per mole, we can interconvert between moles and atoms, or as we'll see in a bit, moles and molecules. All right, so let's look at an example problem of using this flowchart. Uh, if we have mass, we can use molar mass to convert to moles. We can use Avogadro's number to convert to atoms. And the opposite is also true. If we're starting with atoms, use Avogadro's number as a conversion factor to get to moles, and then use molar mass as a conversion factor to get to mass. So again, let's see an example of this flowchart in action. How many aluminum atoms are there in a can that has a mass of 16.2 grams. So this is the average mass of your good old aluminum can. So if you're drinking some type of hot beverage on a summer day, let's say Coke, you finish the beverage, but you're holding the can and you find yourself wondering, I wonder how many atom, like aluminum atoms I'm holding in my hand right now. Well, we have the tools to actually calculate approximately how many aluminum atoms you actually have in your hand. So we're gonna start with what we know. We're gonna start with the fact that you have allegedly measured the can, what its mass is, and it has a mass of 16.2 grams. Well, we're gonna go back to our flow chart, and I'm actually gonna clean this slide up a little bit. So we are currently right here. So we know that the mass is 16.2 grams. We want to figure out how many atoms there are in the can. Well, in order to do so, we must first use the molar mass to calculate the numbers of moles, and then use Avogadro's number to calculate the number of atoms. So if we know the atomic molar mass of aluminum, we can figure this out. Well, all we have to do to figure out what the atomic molar mass of aluminum is, is look at the periodic table. So the, I'm gonna write this down here, the periodic table has, I'll say has, all atomic molar masses. Right, so again, not only are those average masses on the periodic table present in atomic mass units, if you're just looking at the mass of a single atom, they are also present in grams per mole for every substance. The same number applies. The same number works for both. Again, just because of how the scientists back who are working on this problem cleverly set up the, uh, their work so that way like the numbers would all be self-consistent. All right, so I think I have given you enough of a head start. Uh, you know where to find the atomic molar mass. Again, just to go back to the flowchart, we know what Avogadro's number is since this is equal to 6.022 times 10 to the 23rd. In this case, it's going to be atoms per mole. So you have your conversion factors. Try and set up the problem for yourself. How many atoms are there in this single aluminum can? And now if this is the moment when you have unpaused the video to continue the calculation all in a group, what I'm gonna do is set up both of our conversion factors again, like we've done before, in one big string, in one big calculation. So in order to get out of the unit of the gram and into the unit of the mole, we need to use our atomic molar mass. Well, on the periodic table, we can find that aluminum has an atomic molar mass of 26, 0.98 grams per every mole. Now what this looks like if we want to really set it up as like a conversion factor in a way that we've seen before is we are going to keep the number with the mass because everything is per the mole. So this is going to look like 26.98 grams per every one mole. And so now we have something that looks a little bit more like a conversion factor that we have seen before. We just want to make sure that the conversion factor is oriented in the way that it's going to get us out of the unit that we don't want to be in anymore and get us into the unit that we do want to be in. So in order to get out of the unit that we are currently in, which is the gram, just as our conversion factors before, just like dimensional analysis before, we are going to take this molar mass, we're going to put the 26.98 grams in the denominator so that way grams cancel out 
And also just like before, we're gonna keep our chin up. We wanna keep the unit that we want to be in up on top. So our one mole, which is where we are trying to get into, is going to be up on top. Right, and just to reiterate, going back to our flow chart again, we have started in the mass. We wanted to get to the moles as a pit stop on the way to the number of atoms. So we currently got out of the unit of mass, uh, specifically the unit in grams. We have gotten into the unit now of the mole. All right, so in order to get out of the mole and into the atom, uh, which we can see on our flowchart here, we have to use Avogadro's number, which is 6.022 times 10 to the 23rd atoms per mole. All right, so just like our first conversion factor right here, we wanna make sure the unit that we no longer want to be in is down below, right? We're leaving that behind. Now in Avogadro's number, which is 6.022 times 10 to the 23rd of whatever, it is per the mole, which means the one mole is going to be on the opposite side of the number, the 6.022 times 10 to the 23rd atoms. And again, we want the atoms up on top since this is our way of keeping our chin up. We are moving in the direction of the atom. The mole is going to go away. All right, now we have all of the conversions that we need. We have gotten out of the unit of the grams into the unit of the mole and then out of the unit of the mole. And we can see the only unit that remains is that of the atom. So we can crunch our numbers. Uh, our calculator, if you're working with a calculator that can handle numbers large enough, will give you the value of 3.62 times 10 to the 23rd atoms. And this is with significant figures. We started with three significant figures. We can see that our first conversion factor, since we know that these masses are average masses, uh, had four sig figs. Avogadro's number is also a measured quantity, and we can see it presented here also has four sig figs. So the lesser of all of these values, where our first number again had three, just to explicitly write that down, the lesser of all of these numbers is three. So our final answer also is gonna be presented with three significant figures. And now we know approximately how many atoms you are holding in your hand when you are holding an empty aluminum can, right? The mass per aluminum can is gonna vary, but the average mass is somewhere around 16.2 grams. So if you're holding this can, you are holding 3.62 times 10 to the 23rd atoms, or 362, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0. I'm not gonna list out all the zeros, just kidding. It's a huge number though. You're holding a ton of atoms in your hand and you don't even realize it. That's pretty cool. We have the means to calculate how many atoms you are holding in your hand so long as you know what the material is made of. All right, so here we have another Avogadro's number type problem. We're just moving in a different direction in the flow chart. So instead of going from mass to atom, in this problem, we are asked to find the mass, right? What is the mass in grams of a single neon atom? So if we could set up a scale, if we could develop the technology that was sensitive enough to the point that if we placed a single neon atom on top of that scale, what mass reading would it give us? Well, we actually don't even need a scale to figure this out, right? We can use the same type of uh, calculations that we just learned, just in the reverse direction. Instead of going, to go back to our flow chart again, boop, instead of going from mass to atom, we are now starting with one atom. We can use Avogadro's number to figure out how many moles this one atom is equal to, and we can use the molar mass of neon to figure out what the mass of that atom is. Because we know the identity of the atom, the atom is neon. Well, Avogadro's number doesn't really care about the identity of your substance, molar mass does. So if we know Avogadro's number, which we do, and if we know the molar mass of the element we're working with, which we can find, we can figure out what its mass is. All right, so now that I've shown you how to set up the flowchart, we've already seen one example problem together. Um, again, I'm going to encourage you to try and set up this calculation yourself. Starting with one atom of neon, use the conversion factors at your disposal, put both of them together, and find what the mass of your neon atom is.
Okay, now we are going to come back together. Welcome back from unpausing. And if you never pause these videos, again, I'm going to encourage you to. Uh, it's a really good habit to get into when presented with a new idea to see if you can't try it out for yourself. See if your brain can't wrap itself around. And if it can't, if you can't quite get to the right answer or if your answer you feel is kind of off, that's fine too. That's why we double check our work together. Um, so yes, let's come back together, set up our calculation for the mass of one single neon atom. Just like before, we're gonna start with what we know. Single neon atom means that we are starting with one neon atom. One neon atom. We are going to convert the unit of the atom into the unit of the mole using Avogadro's number. It's just going to be presented in the inverse way compared to the previous problem that we have done. So we are uh, going to keep the 6.022 times 10 to the 23rd, since this is where the atom count is. We're going to put this in the denominator, make sure that we are getting away from where we were, and we're going to put the one mole up on top, since this is the direction we are trying to move in according to our flowchart. All right, and once we are in the unit of the mole, all we have to do is check out the periodic table. to find what the mass of a single neon atom is. We check out the periodic table, we would find that the mass is 20.18 grams per every one mole of neon. Right, so this is where this value comes from. The 20.18, again, is in the unit of grams per mole. So we're keeping the 20.18 with the gram. The mole is on the opposite side of the uh, divisional line. Since we're trying to get out of the mole, that's gonna go on bottom. We can see moles now we're gonna cancel out since we have one in the numerator, one in the denominator. And the only unit that remains is the gram, which is the direction we are trying to move in. No, I'm actually gonna rewrite it down here. There's more space down here. So if we crunch these numbers, what is the mass of the single neon atom? The mass of a single neon atom is 3.351 times 10 to the negative 23 grams. Right, so this is a super tiny mass. It's like 0. 0.0000. Basically, we have 22 zeros in a row before we hit 3351. Now, the answer I have written here also has four significant figures. We can see that the number that we started with is actually a perfect integer, right? One is a perfect counting number perfect, which means it doesn't really have applicable sig figs. So we're going to have to look at the conversion factors over here uh, in order to figure out what our number of significant figures is going to be. Well, Avogadro's number, again, is a measured conversion factor. Uh, it is approximate. It's an average. Uh, so we have four significant figures present here as well as the mass from the periodic table also has four significant figures. And so since both of our conversion factors have four sig figs, our answer should also be presented with four sig figs. So 3.351 times 10 to the negative 23rd grams. All right, I believe that the textbook has like a conversion factor to go from uh, like from atom to mass straight away, but this is where it comes from. That conversion factor, if I'm remembering correctly, is actually just the inverse of Avogadro's number. So now we can see where that conversion factor uh, presented in the textbook comes from. And you can also see why you kind of don't need it. I mean, if you know the flow chart, and I'm not saying you have to memorize the flow chart, it's just following the units. We're going from atom to mole to grams in this case. And if you know how the conversion factors go together, you don't really need like the hand holding of the flow chart. But if this is new to you, by all means, use the flow chart. Pull it up in your notes while you're working on homework, while you're working on quizzes, while you're working on labs, whatever you need um, to get that like ingrained in your uh, brain as like habit, uh, pattern recognition, etc. Right, that's what humans are really good at. We're good at finding patterns. So if you're good at finding that pattern, if you recognize the pattern, then you don't really need the flowchart. You don't need a memorized conversion factor. It's just a matter of following the units. All right, so no shame though, if you're not quite there yet, if you need the flowchart, if you uh, need a little bit of like handholding to make sure that you're kind of working through um, the calculations correctly, your units are aligned correctly, they're canceling out correctly, that's totally fine, right? We're starting at the beginning. 
Wherever you are in this journey in chemistry is perfectly acceptable so long as you are keeping up with where we are in the present moment. All right, but we don't just have atoms in the universe, right? It's very rare to come across a substance that is purely made of one entire element. It's part of the reason why like diamonds are so rare. So how do we work with compounds, with uh, substances that are made up of multiple atoms? Well, for this, we need to introduce the molecular molar mass. This is also known as the formula weight. These two terms are synonymous synonymous. I don't think I spelled that correctly, but I'm not going to check myself. These two terms mean the same thing. So the molecular molar mass is the formula weight of one mole of a compound. The units are going to be the same. We're still in grams per mole. How we find formula weight, we can see in this orange box down below. All we need to do is take the sum of all of our atomic molar masses. And the flow chart at the very bottom looks the exact same. So if we know the mass of our compound, say of compound, in this case, we can use the molar mass of the compound, which is what our formula weight is gonna be. We'll give an example in a second. So if we have our formula weight, we can use that to get from mass into the mole or from the mole into mass. Avogadro's number, again, is 6.022 times 10 to the 23rd of whatever. So it's not that Avogadro's number is locked into atoms. It could also be molecules as well, right? Again, functions like a dozen. All that matters is that you have 6.022 times 10 to the 23rd of whatever it is that you're working with. And this is going to be equal to one mole. Bracket that off. And we can use then Avogadro's number, since we can substitute the word atom for molecule here, we can use that to get or interconvert between molecules and moles. All right, so let's give an example or example of a formula weight. Let's look at our good old example, water. So H2O is comprised of two hydrogens and one oxygen. And masses function off of sums, like there's no uh, additional like multiple or scalar factor. If you have two hydrogens and one oxygen, the mass of water is going to be the sum of the two hydrogens and the one oxygen. So the atomic uh, or the molecular molar mass is going to work in the exact same way. We have two hydrogens, so we're going to take two times whatever the atomic molar mass of hydrogen is on the periodic table, which is 1.008 grams per mole. And we are going to add that to the single atomic molar mass of our one oxygen inside of the H2O, which is equal to 16.00 grams per mole. This gives us a molar mass, right? A molecular molar mass for water that is approximately equal to 18.02 grams per every mole. Right, so water itself may not be just explicitly presented on the periodic table, but hydrogen and oxygen are, and we can use this information to find what the molecular molar mass of water is. So if we had any calculation that involved Let's do this. That involved water, like we had a cup of water, we knew its mass was like, you know, four grams, let's say. We could use this molecular molar mass to figure out how many moles of water we are working with, and then how many molecules of water we are working with. All right, so what we're going to do is work through a similar problem to what I've just outlined, um, but not quite the exact same. Instead, we're working with sugar. Chemical formula looks a little bit more complicated, but our question here is how many molecules of sugar are there in a 2.25 gram spoonful? So if you, like me, are the type of person who uh, drinks coffee every day, first and foremost, but in addition to that, likes to add a spoonful of sugar to your coffee just because it helps to, you know, cut the bitterness a little bit, the average mass of a spoonful of sugar is 2.25 grams. So what we're looking for here is quite literally how many molecules of sugar, assuming that your sugar is just straight up glucose, 
which if you're buying, you know, sugar at the store, uh, either like raw sugar or uh, processed sugar, um, it is all glucose. It's all just C6H12O6. Um, so we don't have to assume any like averaging for a mixture. It's just straight up one compound. You have a spoonful of sugar. How many molecules are there? All right, so we've seen a couple of example problems like this already. So I encourage you again to see if you can't figure this out for yourself. There are actually two different things that we have to solve for here. So let me get you off on the right foot. First, we need to find the formula weight of our C6H12O6 in much the same way that we just found the formula weight for water on the previous slide. Next, we need to use that formula weight to figure out how many molecules there are. So these are the two things that you are meant to find. So try uh, this out for yourself. See if you can't figure out this calculation. See if you're getting a hang for where uh, these calculations are going, how they're set up. And we will check our answers together in a moment. All right, welcome back. Let us figure out what the formula weight of sugar is and how many molecules there are in a single spoonful of sugar. All right, so our formula weight, we can use our chemical formula, C6H12O6, to figure out what the formula weight of the entirety of glucose is. So we can see in, according to our chemical formula, we have six carbons, we have 12 hydrogens, and we have six oxygens. Again, the subscript that follows the element corresponds to how many of that element are present inside of the chemical formula. So we have six carbons, we have 12 hydrogens, and we have six oxygens. I'm just gonna parentheses these off to make it clear. We need to find the elemental symbol for carbon, for hydrogen, and for oxygen on the periodic table and use the, uh, the atomic molar masses presented to find the formula weight for sugar. All right, so if we observe the periodic table to find where the uh, atomic molar masses of the carbon, the hydrogen, and the oxygen from glucose are, we would see that uh, carbon, which has an atomic molar mass of 12.01, according to your guys' periodic tables, and this is in grams per mole. Again, what's a number without a unit? Want to make sure we're including the units here. We are going to add to that 12 times the atomic molar mass for hydrogen, which is 1.008 grams per mole. And we are going to add to that six times the atomic molar mass of our oxygen, which is 16.01, or zero, zero, sorry, grams per mole. I just literally looked up at the uh, carbons up here and saw a zero, one, and they just wrote a zero, one. Oxygen is 16.00. All right, we're going to crunch the numbers then. Uh, if we're following significant figures, this is the type of problem where we have multiple algebraic operations. And so I will freely admit, I'm not a huge stickler for significant figures. If you're in the right ballpark for where the sig figs should be, you're fine. Um, however, let's just break down the problem and see if we can't figure out what the sig figs should be. Well, the six, the 12, and the six are all perfect integers right? They're counting numbers. They're how many of the element we are working with. So they don't count. So after the first multiplication or the first round of multiplications, right? Six times 12.01, 12 point or 12 times 1.008 and six times 16.00. Uh, each of these numbers will have four significant figures present. And each of those four significant figures then will end up being present out to the hundreds place. So because each of these significant figures after the first round of multiplications are out to the hundreds place, coincidentally, just because of how that multiplication worked out, we wanna keep four significant figures. At the addition step, again, we want to make sure that all of our significant figures are out to the hundreds place, hundredths place, just to emphasize it's after the, the decimal point we're out here, because that second algebraic step is addition. So we, the uh, it's the decimal place that's gonna matter there. So the atomic molar mass that we are going to write out with proper significant figures is 180.16 grams per mole. 
All right, so again, I'm not a huge stickler for significant figures. So if you saw that each of these numbers have four sig figs and you instead wrote out 180.2 instead of 180.16, it's fine. You're close enough, um, right? We're just learning about sig figs at this point. If you wanna follow step-by-step step and get really good at it, technically speaking, if you're that type of like detail-oriented person, I'm not gonna stop you. I mean, you should be striving for reporting your answers in proper significant figures. I just wanna disclaim and say like, in this stage while you're learning, I'm not gonna be marking off a huge number of points because the number of significant figures is like off. You're fine. All right, so now that we have the uh, molar mass for our sugar, we can use the molar mass, starting again with the mass that we know to calculate how many molecules of sugar there are in that spoonful. That's been the goal. So we're gonna start with what we know, the 2.25 grams of C6H12O6. We're gonna multiply this by the form of the molar mass that is going to get us out of the unit of the gram and into the unit of the mole. So we wanna make sure that grams are down below, so grams cancel, and the mole is up on top since that's the direction we want to move into. We can see, again, just to reiterate, we're like finding patterns here, we're finding clues. The 180.16 is with the gram. So that should be true when we're setting up our conversion factor as well. The 180.16 should be with the gram, which means it should be in the denominator. The number in front of the mole here is just a number one. We are going to multiply this then by, again, the version of Avogadro's number that is going to get us out of the unit of the mole and into the unit of the molecule. If we observe Avogadro's number, the actual numeric component of Avogadro's number always goes with the something that we're trying to like work with. Um, not the mole, the mole's always there, but like atoms, molecules, moles, uh, eggs, whatever the situation is. Um, 6.022 times 10 to the 23rd molecules per every one mole. So this is how we set up our conversion factors. The grams are gonna cancel out. We can see in the second step then, uh, moles are going to cancel out since we have one in the numerator multiplied by one in the denominator, totally canceling out. We are left only with the unit of the molecule. All right, and I'm kind of running out of space, but I do have enough space down here in the corner to write what our answer is, which is gonna be 7.52 times 10 to the 21st molecule. There we go. In fact, I'll even just write it up here on the top of the slide just to make it really clear. 7.52 times 10 to the 21st molecules. All right, so that is a 752 followed by 19 zeros. And that's how many molecules that we are on average working with when you have a spoonful of sugar. So again, it's just astounding that based off of a simple mass measurement, we have the most like rudimentary tools at our disposal, simple algebra, numbers that have been reported, standardized, uh, you know, given to us from those who have come before us. And we can calculate exactly how many atoms, how many molecules there are in a sample that we are working with. Like, it's extraordinarily mind boggling if you allow yourself the time to kind of sit and realize the implications of the calculations we're working with. But if there is a reason that we have seen farther, it is because we are standing on the shoulders of giants, right? We are taking full advantage of everything that has come before us. And I think it's important to acknowledge that. All right, and that brings us to the end of chapter two. So today we have, again, just introduced like, how do we keep track of how do we count how many atoms, how many molecules we are working with? So we introduced the unit of the mole presented as Avogadro's number, which is a capital N sub capital A number Avogadro, right? Avogadro's number, which is that 6.022 times 10 to the 23rd of whatever per mole. Molar mass. We also have talked about, so now we have all of, like we actually have a use for all of those masses on the periodic table. It's going to become a very regular tool that we are going to turn to, that periodic table and all of the masses there. We've also talked about molecular uh, and formula masses. Now I do want to acknowledge if you actually are going through and uh, you know using these section reviews as example problems. We uh, 
in the second half of this lesson kind of jumped ahead to chapter five, right? This page number and these uh, section review problems are not a typo. The reason why I talk about it here is like, I honestly don't know why the textbook waits until chapter five to talk about molecular masses when like they're so useful now and it just naturally flows from what we were like literally just talking about. So I'm not gonna wait. I'm not gonna wait until chapter five to introduce this slightly more complicated problem. Whether you're working with atoms or you're working with molecules, the process is the exact same. And I also want to state if you're working with, uh, right, grams, moles, atoms, slash, molecules, all of the example problems we did today went from one side, so let's say grams, all the way to the other. And the reason why is I want to showcase, like, again, the most complicated form of this type of example problem, so if you want to approach the simpler problems, you can do so yourself. In other words, just because we today in class went from grams all the way to atoms or molecules, it doesn't mean that the problem's always going to be that. Sometimes you are going to be asked just to go from grams to moles, and that's it. If that's the case, you don't need to use Avogadro's number at any point. You don't need to get into the unit of the atoms or the molecules. If you're looking at the flow chart, it is not necessary that you go all the way from one side to the other. Sometimes you are just asked to go from grams to moles. Sometimes you're just asked to go from moles to grams. Sometimes you're just asked to go from moles to atoms or molecules and vice versa. So be sure that you are critically thinking about what type of problem you are working with and exactly what's being asked of you. What's the information you're being given? What is it that you are asked to find? If you don't need to go through all of the conversions, then you don't need to go through all of the conversions, and that's totally fine. Use the tools at your disposal to solve the problem that is in front of you the best as you can. All right, if you have any homework, do your homework, and otherwise, class is dismissed. <laughs>